The Bible is the written Word of God. Within its pages we find the wisdom of God. We find what is best for the human race, how God intends for life to be conducted. I hope you'll join with me today on our program as we examine how God feels about capital punishment. Till the good news was written and the full truth revealed That the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real Our Lord in His wisdom gave men gifts from above The Spirit then taught them the truth in love And now your host for The Truth in Love, Dave Miller. Very early in human history, God decreed that murderers were to forfeit their own lives. The wording of the passage is, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he the man. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. That standard continued into the Mosaic period. Read Numbers 35, 33. As a matter of fact, you might be surprised to learn that the law which God gave to Moses to regulate the Israelite nation made provision for at least 16 capital crimes. That is, in 16 instances where the law was broken, the death penalty was to be invoked. I'd like for you to note these with me, please, very briefly. The first four may be categorized as pertaining to civil matters. Number one, under the law of Moses, the death penalty was required in cases of premeditated murder. Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 through 14, and verses 22 through 23, also Leviticus 24, 17, and Numbers 35, 16 through 21. Interestingly enough, this regulation even included the situation in which two men might be fighting and in the process of their scuffling caused the death of an innocent bystander or that innocent bystander's unborn infant. But this capital crime did not include accidental homicide, what we would call manslaughter. Secondly, kidnapping was a capital crime under the Old Testament as well. Read Exodus 21, 16 and Deuteronomy 24, verse 7. I saw a movie recently that was based on an actual incident in which a seven-year-old boy was kidnapped as he was walking home from school. The man who stole that child kept him for some seven years, putting the child through emotional and sexual abuse before the boy, now 15, was finally returned to his parents. He was a different child, would never be the same. You know, God would not tolerate such a thing in the Old Testament. And we would stop a lot of that kind of thing in our country if we would take such crimes more seriously. A third capital crime under the Old Testament, a person could be put to death for striking or cursing his parents. Read Exodus 21, verses 15 and 17, and Leviticus 20, verse 9. Jesus alluded to this very point in Matthew chapter 15, verse 4, and Mark 7, verse 10. Number four, incorrigible rebelliousness was punishable by death under the old law. Deuteronomy 17, 12. For example, a stubborn, disobedient, rebellious son who would not submit to parents or to civil authorities was to be taken out and stoned to death. Read Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. Now there are four crimes under the old law that pertain to civil law that involve the death penalty. The next six capital crimes that we want to identify might be designated more specifically religious matters. For example, sacrificing to false gods was a capital crime in the Old Testament, Exodus 22, verse 20. Violating the Sabbath brought the death penalty, Exodus 35, verse 2, and Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Blasphemy or cursing God warranted the death penalty, Leviticus 24, verses 10 through 16, and also verse 23. The uh, false prophet, one who tried to entice the people into idolatry, was to be executed, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 11. And so were the people who were influenced by that false prophet, Deuteronomy 13, verses 12 
through 18. Another capital crime under the Old Testament, human sacrifice. Leviticus 20, verse 2. You see, there were Israelites who were tempted to offer their children to false pagan deities like Molech. But that was despicable to God and brought the death penalty. A tenth capital crime was uh, one in which a person involved uh, him or herself in divination or the magical arts. And so under Mosaic law, witches, sorcerers, wizards, mediums, uh, charmers, soothsayers, diviners, spiritists, and enchanters were to be put to death. Read Exodus 22, verse 18. Leviticus 19, verses 26 and 31. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. And also Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. So there are six capital crimes that pertain directly to religious activity, plus the previous four that have to do with civil matters. Now we turn to an additional six crimes that pertain to sexual matters. And so this would be crime number 11, adultery. The act of adultery was punishable by death under the Old Testament. Read Leviticus chapter 20, verses 10 through 21, and Deuteronomy 22, 22. Can you imagine what would happen in our own country if adultery brought the death penalty? Most of Hollywood would be wiped out as, as well as a sizable portion of the rest of our population. Capital crime number 12, bestiality, that is, having sexual relations with an animal. That was punishable by death, Exodus 22, 19, and Leviticus chapter 20, verses 15 through 16. Incest was a capital offense in the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, 6 through 17, and Leviticus chapter 20, verses 11, 12, and 14. And then we move to homosexuality. That too was a capital crime under the old law of Moses, Leviticus 18, 22, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. And then we come to premarital sex, which brought the death penalty, Leviticus 21, 9, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 20 through 21. And then rape of an engaged or married woman was a capital crime in the Old Testament, Read Deuteronomy 22, verses 25 through 27. Again, imagine what would happen in this country if rape brought the death penalty. We definitely could put a stop to the insane treatment of women that some are getting away with in our culture. Notice what we have discovered about God's will for the Jewish nation in the Old Testament. The death penalty was a viable form of punishment for at least 16 separate offenses. You know, some people have misunderstood one of the Ten Commandments, which says, Thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20, verse 13. They have assumed that the law forbade taking anyone's life under any circumstances. But we've just seen where God required the death penalty for some 16 crimes. So the commandment, would have been better translated, thou shalt not murder. In other words, the command is a prohibition against an individual taking the law into his own hands and exercising personal vengeance. But God wanted the execution of lawbreakers to be carried out by duly constituted legal authorities. When we come to the New Testament, which reveals to us God's will this side of the cross, we find that God has not changed in this respect. The New Testament clearly teaches that capital punishment is God's will for human civilization. Consider, for example, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. That passage reads, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. 
for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now that passage from Romans 13 clearly affirms that the state, civil government, has the God-ordained responsibility to keep law and order and to protect its citizens against evildoers. When Paul used the word sword in this passage, he was referring to capital punishment. And so God wants duly constituted civil authority to invoke the death penalty upon citizens who commit crimes worthy of death. Ah, oh, but you see, for about the last 30 years, we have actually witnessed a breakdown on the part of our judicial and law enforcement system. Our government has failed to bear the sword. Instead, we have overrun our prison system with incorrigible criminals, and then we have turned right around and given premature parole and early release to make room for the increasing number of lawbreakers. The Apostle Paul himself articulated the correct attitude when he stood before Portius Festus, a civil authority, and defended himself by stating, if I am an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I do not object to dying. Acts 25 verse 11. Notice that Paul was acknowledging that the state properly possesses the power of life and death in the administration of civil justice. Peter held the same position as that of Paul. He enjoined obedience to the government, which has been sent by God for the punishment of evil doers. 1 Peter 2.14 and compare that with Titus 3 verse 1. Jesus himself implied the propriety of capital punishment when he told the parable of the pounds. You remember how those who rebelled against the king were to be brought and executed in his presence. Luke 19.27. Compare that parable with the one that Jesus told about the wicked husbandman in Luke 20, 15 through 16. In that parable, Jesus indicated that the owner of the vineyard would return and destroy the husbandman. But someone may raise some possible objections to what we've observed from both the Old and the New Testament. Someone might raise the question, uh, didn't Jesus teach that we should turn the other cheek? Well, yes, he did in Matthew 5:39. But in that context, if you will study that passage, Jesus is simply impressing upon the Jews their need to not engage in personal vendettas. The same point is stressed in Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. In that passage, Paul said, Recompense to no man evil for evil. He also said, Avenge not yourselves. In other words, Christians are not to take the law into their own hands and engage in vengeful retaliation. God insists that vengeance belongs to Him. Notice, however, that Romans 13 picks up right where Romans 12 leaves off and shows how God takes vengeance. He employs civil government as the instrumentality for imposing the death penalty. And so individual citizens are not to engage in vigilante tactics. Rather, God wants the legal authorities to punish criminals and thereby protect the rest of society. Someone says, but what about the woman taken in adultery? Didn't Jesus exonerate her and leave her uncondemned? I suppose the story about the woman taken in adultery in John chapter 8 has been misused and misapplied in any other scripture. Again, if you will study this passage carefully, you will find that it harmonizes perfectly with the principle of capital punishment. At least four extenuating circumstances necessitated Jesus leaving the woman uncondemned. Number one, Mosaic regulations stated that a person could be executed only 
if there were two or more witnesses to the crime. Read Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. You see, one witness was insufficient to evoke the death penalty. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Well, this woman uh, was reportedly caught in the very act, but nothing is said of the identity of the witnesses. There may, you see, have been only one. Uh, secondly, even if there were two or more witnesses present to verify the woman's sin, the Old Testament was equally explicit concerning the fact that both the woman and the man were to be executed. Leviticus 20, verse 10, Deuteronomy 22, 22. No one ever asked the question, where was the man? Obviously, this was a trumped-up situation that did not even fit the mosaic preconditions for invoking capital punishment. Obedience to the law of Moses in that particular case actually meant letting the woman go. A third point to take into consideration is the precise meaning of the phrase, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, John chapter 8, verse 7. If that statement is taken as a blanket prohibition against capital punishment, then that passage flatly contradicts Romans 13. Instead, what Jesus is getting at here is what Paul meant when he said in Romans 2.1, Thou that judgest doest the same things. In other words, Jesus knew that the woman's accusers were guilty of the very thing they were wanting to nail her for. He was able to prick them of their guilt, causing them to realize that he knew that they were guilty of the very same thing. The old law made clear that the witnesses to the crime were to cast the first stones. Deuteronomy 17, 7, Jesus was therefore striking directly at the fact that the woman's accusers were ineligible to fulfill that role. And then there's a fourth point, and finally, that you ought to take into consideration when you read John chapter 8. And that is that capital punishment would have had to have been levied by a duly constituted court of law. This mob that brought this woman to Jesus was actually engaging in an illegal action, a lynching. Jesus, though the Son of God, would not have interfered in the responsibility of the appropriate judicial authorities to handle the situation. You remember on another occasion when one of two brothers approached Jesus out of a crowd and asked Him to settle a probate dispute. Jesus' response to that fellow was, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Luke 12, 14. So the effort by this mob in John 8 to ensnare Jesus was without legal justification. And so you see Jesus actually handled the situation appropriately in keeping with legal protocol of both Old Testament law as well as Roman civil law. The woman clearly violated God's law. She deserved the death penalty, but the necessary prerequisites for pronouncing the execution sentence were lacking, which is precisely what Jesus meant when He said, Neither do I condemn you. In other words, the legal stipulations which were needed to establish her guilt were not in place, and so He could not override the law and condemn her. Jesus' action on this occasion therefore in no way discredits the legitimacy of capital punishment. Another point that someone might raise in an effort to challenge the propriety of capital punishment is the insistence by some that the death penalty serves no useful purpose, especially when it comes to deterring other criminals from their course of action. Again, I'm convinced we've heard this kind of humanistic, uninformed reasoning for some 30 years. And I might be tempted to believe it if it were not for the inspired Word of God informing me to the contrary. Even if capital punishment did not serve as a deterrent, it would still serve at least one other worthwhile purpose, the elimination from society of those elements that persist in destructive behavior. The Bible teaches that some people can be hardened into a sinful, wicked condition. They have become so cold, so cruel, so mean, that even the threat of death does not faze them. Paul referred to those whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron, 1 Timothy 4.2. 2. 
Some people are so hardened that they are described as past feeling, completely given over to wickedness. Ephesians 4, verse 19. God Himself invoked the death penalty upon an entire generation because their wickedness was, quote, great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. Read Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. So the human heart and mind can become so alienated from right and good and truth that that person is unreachable, incorrigible, and irretrievable. Their execution would spare the law-abiding citizens any further perpetration of death and suffering by those who engage in such repetitive actions. How horrible and senseless it is that so many Americans have had to suffer terribly at the hands of criminals who have already been found guilty of previous crimes, but who were permitted to go free and repeat their criminal behavior. So, even if capital punishment was not a deterrent, it is still a necessary option in society because it holds in check the growth and spread of hardened criminals. I urge you to study carefully the expression, so you shall put away the evil from your midst. Deuteronomy 13.5 and Deuteronomy 17.7. Seven. Deuteronomy 19 verse 19 and Deuteronomy 21.21 21, 21, and Deuteronomy 22 verse 21. Also 1 Corinthians 5.13. Now having said that, as a matter of fact, the Bible clearly teaches that the application of penal punishment, including the death penalty, is in fact a deterrent. For example, God wanted the death penalty imposed upon any individual, including a person's relative, who attempted to secretly entice others into idolatry. That person was to, was to be stoned to death in the presence of the entire nation. And notice this resulting effect. So all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you." Deuteronomy 13, verse 11. Another instance of this rationale for deterrency is seen in the pronouncement of death upon the incorrigible rebel. And all the people shall hear and fear, and no longer act presumptuously. Deuteronomy 17, 13. That principle again stated, when the Jews were instructed to take a rebellious and stubborn son and stone him to death, with this effect, all Israel shall hear and fear, Deuteronomy 21, 21. This same perspective is illustrated even in the New Testament. Paul emphasized that elders in the church who sinned were to re be rebuked publicly, that others also may fear, 1 Timothy 5, 20. Ananias and Sapphira, a Christian couple in the early church, were divinely executed in Acts 5, and in the very next verse Luke writes, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Acts 5 verse 11. Hey, these passages alone prove that a direct link exists between punishment and execution on the one hand and the caution that it instills in others on the other hand. Do you know that the Bible teaches the corollary of this principle as well? Where there is inadequate, insufficient, or delayed punishment, Crime and violence increase? Notice with me Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Folks, we are seeing in America this very principle coming to pass before our eyes. The court system is clogged and backed up to the point that most cases do not come to trial for literally years. Criminals who have been shown to be guilty of multiple murders and other heinous crimes are given light sentences, while those who deserve far less are given exorbitant sentences. We've made a mockery of the justice system. Those circumstances, according to the Bible, only serve to encourage more lawlessness. The overall citizenry can't help but grow lax in their own attitudes. This principle is evident in the biblical expression, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Folks, if you believe the Bible, you must believe that capital punishment is a deterrent. 
You must also believe that the elimination of hardened criminals is necessary if our society is to survive. The liberal humanistic values that have held sway in this country for the last 30 years are taking their toll and we'd better get back to God's view of things before we lose it all. One final quibble that <clears throat> someone might raise is the capital punishment would seem to be a rather extreme step to take since it is a cruel, barbaric, and violent action that is as violent as the criminal's action himself. Aren't we resorting to the same kind of behavior as the criminal, someone might say? Isn't capital punishment a vindictive retaliation? Well, the Bible response to that question is seen in, in the phrase, His blood be upon him, Leviticus 20 verses 9, 13, and 27, and Deuteronomy 19, 10. And His blood be upon His own head, Joshua 2, 19, 2 Samuel 1, 16, Ezekiel 33, 4. In other words, those who carry out the death penalty are in reality neutral third parties. They're merely carrying out the will of God and dispensing justice. The criminal is simply receiving what he brought upon himself, his just deserts. The expression, His blood be upon him, indicates that God assigns responsibility for the execution to the one being executed. It's like telling our small children, if you put your hand in the fire, you're going to get burned. There are consequences to your own actions. If you do not want to be executed, do not commit any act that merits death. If you do commit such an act, you have brought upon yourself. You have earned the death penalty and you deserve to get what you have earned. So rather than oppose those who promote capital punishment, painting them as insensitive ogres or uncaring, calloused, uncivilized barbarians, our efforts would be better spent focusing on the barbaric behavior of the criminals who rape and plunder and pillage our people. It is their behavior that should be kept before us. Our tears, our compassion ought to center upon the innocent victims and their families. Lethal injection of a wicked evildoer can hardly match the violent, inhuman suffering and death experienced by the innocent victims of crime. They continue to suffer even though the perpetrator carries on for years through many trials, many appeals before justice is served if it ever is. My friend, the God of the Bible is incensed and outraged at such circumstances. The time has come to start listening to Him. Thank you for listening to me today. I urge you, I plead with you to study the Bible on these matters. Don't, don't listen to people. Don't listen to politicians or the media or sociologists. Listen to God. Take your Bible and study it and see if I've not represented God's view on this thing correctly. If I can help you further, we'll provide you the material that we've presented today in the form of an audio cassette tape or a written transcript. All you have to do is write us at The Truth in Love, P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Request the audio cassette tape or the written transcript. We'll send it to you free of charge. May God bless you this week. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth, speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Speaking the truth.